Welcome to BFC Live, the daily video and podcast series of Business of Cannabis. BFC Live highlights the companies, brands, people, and trends driving the global cannabis sector. Learn more at businessofcannabis.ca. Our BFC Live guest today is Greg Engel, the CEO of Organogram, wanted to connect with him about all things Organogram. Note, this does not include their major investment they received earlier this morning of $221 million from BAT, as the interview was recorded prior to that announcement. Welcome to BFC Live, Greg, Eng- Greg Engel. Nice to see you. Hey, great to see you again, Jay. Uh, you win this week's best background. <laughs> so congratulations for giving a thought and implementing. Thanks. <laughs> uh, 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 two years ago this week, it seems like 20, but two years ago this week, we were actually, the Business of Cannabis team were actually in Moncton, in the facility uh, in New Brunswick. That does seem like a long time ago on several fronts, but the one that I'm most interested in sort of talking to you about is, what have you seen, at the, I don't know if you wanna talk about three, four or 300 changes in the industry since then, but talk a little bit about sort of what the biggest changes you've seen in the past two years as we've sort of gone through this uh, legalization process in Canada. Yeah, you know, I think if you look over the last two years, I mean, um, certainly the globe, globally, we've all been impacted by COVID, both personally, professionally, and all and that, and over the last 12 months. But, you know, over the last two years, I think the, there's probably three really big changes that we've seen. So one is, you know, um, one of the biggest challenges early on as in Canada was the, you know, the lack of a commercial footprint here in Ontario, right, and, and Ontario having that limited footprint. So that's, that's growing. It's being resolved. Um, you know, there's still some pockets in the province that are without retail, and that's still a significant issue. Um, so I think that's been a big plus, is you know, growing and, and giving consumers more choice. I, I think the two other changes we've seen as an industry is that, you know, in the early days, consumers were, um, you know, were really there wasn't as as much product out there as ideally you would want. So they were kind of limited on their choices. So I think, you know, we've seen educations improve in terms of the bud tenders as more product offerings have come out. Um, and, you know, that's put put companies like Organogram in a position where you've got to continue to up your game and improve the quality of what you're bringing to market. And that's been a big part of our efforts over the last, certainly, you know, 12 to 18 months, certainly, is bringing those new products to market because the consumers have become more discerning, right? And I think that's been a big, a big part of it. And I think the, the third thing really is, you know, we, we've seen the growth of the, the value brand and the kind of uh, low cost, large volume skew. And I think, um, you know, that's given consumers, uh, uh, you know, a, a price point where for consumers that were previously buying in the illicit market, uh, attracted them to the legal market. And I think we've, we've certainly taken an innovative approach to that segment with our shred, um, which has been, you know, four months in a row now in Ontario, the, the number one search brand. And, you know, that's been a, a, a big win for us. And I think, you know, those have been probably the three biggest things that have impacted the industry overall. Yeah. And we, we talked to a lot of retailers doing a lot of sort of content and events and sort of insights into what's happening on the retail front, especially in Ontario as the ramp up and, and shred is on the top of their, that's on the top of consumers sort of questions they come in, but also on tops retailers want it on their shelves because people are coming in for it. Right. And kudos to you, because this is not, it's not an easy thing to do to say, we want to launch something new. We're going to call it something new. And then we're going to, I don't even know how you go about sort of educating all the people in the educating from the provincial sort of wholesalers to, you know, really granularly like retailers on the ground and their bud tenders talking about it. But that's, that's part of the, I guess that's part of the benefit of having been around as long as sort of organogram has is that those relationships are there and that infrastructure is there to make those connections. Is that, is that part of the success? I, I think there's two things that are driven success. One is certainly that uh, for us, you know, we have those existing relationships and we've, we've always taken a big focus from day one of the rec launch of focusing on the retail environment. So whether or not it's through point of sale material, big focus on education with the bud tenders and making sure that they understand our products um, you know, we've had a national sales force since day one, and I think that's been a big part of our success is just having those interactions with the bud tenders, right? Ultimately, they're your salesperson with the consumer, and that's really important. I think the other is just in terms of how we created it, right? We, we took a very selective approach with Shred and coming up with three unique blends um, where, you know, it was about flavor profile. Someone's going to buy a pre-milled product in large volume. Um, you know, it better not only have a, you know, really good cannabinoid level, but it should have a great flavor and taste and smell and everything that consumers are looking for. So um, been very selective in creating what that looks like. And I think, 
you know, that's had a big impact on it. And I mean, the success has been overwhelming. We, uh, you know, we've been challenged to keep it in stock and, and have had a lot of stock outs consistently with it. So, uh, you know, we're ramping up and, and we're one of the only companies that's really, you know, I would say over the last kind of six, eight months has been in ramp up mode, right? Versus where we've seen over the last, you know, 12, 15 months, so many companies contracting because um, the demand is there, not only for Shred, but for our Edison and especially our new genetics. Yeah, it's interesting. We uh, talking about the national sales force we had on last week, one of your uh, uh, national sales people um, in Alberta, Susan Kumar, who's really involved in the Mount Royal University cannabis education program, which is why we had her on. But it really, you start to see the footprint of companies like yours that have had this very thoughtful approach to say, we live in a big country, we want to be everywhere, we want to get our products to shelves. That doesn't just take um, being able to produce it, that is, of course, part of it and keeping it on shelves, but actually getting down to the granular level to actually have these relationships where um, stores want it and bud tenders know how to sac- actually talk about it. And that, that's really compelling. Um, yeah, it's, and I'm just maybe add one point. Yeah. I mean, pre-COVID, one of the big things we focused on too was the consumer intercepts in provinces like Alberta that allow it, right? So having that experience where our salespeople could actually directly interact with consumers uh, with special events and, you know, hopefully we turn to some level of normalcy and those can happen again. I mean, some of those things are happening virtually now. I know some of the retail chains are looking to do more of that and that's, that those are great initiatives for them with their customer base. So, yeah, it's also, I mean, if you look at the discrepancy between what's allowed in alcohol and beverage and what's allowed in cannabis, it's like, you know, I mean, you go to an LCBO in Ontario and they will pour you wine in real time (laughs) and have you drink it there. Like it's, there's a bit of that uh, breweries, I think are allowed to give you like six beers a year, like as a giveaway. It's like, it's like, like yeah, we're, we're, we'd like to see some equity there. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so. Or something even closer to what it is now. I mean, and then you get to the equivalencies of all those things as well. And that's, that's sort of part of it. Um, we we'll like to get there. I want to talk a bit about sort of the business structure and the sort of capital markets, because uh, we covered a piece that new cannabis ventures did around uh, we called it sort of the Goldilocks size of a cannabis company. There was the tier one, sort of the big four. Then there was like tier two and tier three, the way New Cannabis Ventures describes them. But but really what they were describing and we sort of covered as well was, you know, the the tier two and tier three, sort of the the, the large but medium. And, and then the smaller ones are actually doing much better work uh, or much better revenue, much better profit. And I want to sort of ask you about that. And, and is, is there a sweet spot for a cannabis company in, in Canada that balances sort of the reach you're talking about on a national scale, but also the cultivation footprint that you guys have. Talk a little bit about that balance and sort of how you think about that as a company. Yeah, I think, you know, our focus, and I mean, again, I was fortunate when I joined again ground four years ago, I'd, I'd been in the cannabis space for a couple of years before that. And um, so, you know, when I looked at it in terms of, you know, where could we go and how should Organogram grow and, you know, where should our focus be? And we, you know, we, we could see, and I saw that there was a, an opportunity for a large indoor facility, right? And I think where, um, you know, we know that in general, uh, indoor product um, is perceived as being higher quality than green, traditional greenhouse grown product. Um, and so, you know, and, and we've been focusing on that and certainly having access to new genetics been a big part of that. So I think, you know, one advantage we've had on that side is, you know, having an indoor facility, having over a hundred micro cultivation rooms that allow us to actually, and when I say micro, they're still very large in size. You've been there, Jay, you know how big they are with our three tier grow, but you know, it allows us to be very selective on a strain by strain basis. So I think that's been important, but having, having the resources all at one facility has been a big plus too, right? In terms of, you know, having a core team that understands things. And I think, you know, I, I think, you know, where some companies have had some success with multiple facilities is that they have one facility dedicated for something else, right? So here's their cultivation facility, here's a processing facility. Okay, that makes sense, things like that. But having a whole series of different, um, you know, cultivation facilities, we've seen that contra- contract very dramatically, unless it's a, you know, unless it's a kind of craft grow type facility like a Freya has with Broken Coast, right? So that's a, you know, a bit of a different approach and one that works well for them. So I think that's been one thing that, you know, I think the other is that, um, you know, we've always been a company, at least, and I can't speak for others in this level, but we've been one that's really been focused on, you know, uh, managing our cost structure, managing, um, you know, where we spend and what we spend. And, you know, we all saw, you know, prior to October 70, you know, the run up to legalization and what that looked like was, um, you know, um, when, when legalization kind of ca- came forward and happened and, 
kind of what we saw with that is that, you know, there was crazy amounts of money being spent in the industry, right? And I mean, that was never going to be justified in terms of the revenue that could be attained. And I think we're a company that wasn't doing that. Uh, we were focused on, you know, delivering results and delivering product. Ultimately, the goal was get as much product as you can to the market. And, you know, we've had some bumps along the road, as I said earlier, we're, you know, we've been impacted by COVID as, as many other companies. And, um, you know, and, and we've been fortunate with our facility in New Brunswick that, um, in general, Atlanta, Canada has fared much better than the rest of the country, although recently there's been some few bumps and outbreaks and, uh, but it looks like things have settled back in and, you know, that's been a big plus for us and the health and safety of our employees has been a huge uh, part of our focus. So, yeah, you're talking about the facility. I remember Blaine and I from the business cannabis team were climbing up, up to the third level <laughs> and realize that we should climb back down as soon as possible. It's, <laughs> it's a pretty big room, even though, you, you know, as you described it, but it is, you know, it's three tiers and, and we can actually, we'll post pictures as we do this, because actually on my LinkedIn page is a picture inside one of your rooms that, that uh, we were in. Um, Greg, it's really been great to connect with you because obviously um, anything coming out of New Brunswick we like to talk about, but, but also, um, you know, or Granogram being one of sort of the original companies that, that we ever started talking to. And now sort of as we enter this, I don't even know what we're going to call it, but the post- or hopefully post COVID phase, but also as we get out of COVID, you know, the retail footprint where the products are sold will have increased, you know, two and soon three times what it was. And maybe that's actually the last question. Like, are we going to get to a steady state, I guess, like where we've reached some sort of saturation in Ontario around the rest of the country, maybe BC as well. And we're actually starting to see, you know, retail open up like both in terms of numbers, but also sort of free flowing of people. Um, and sort of a right-sized industry providing the products. Like, are you are you projecting any of those that timeline of when like we see some sort of equilibrium of or normalization? Yeah, you know, it, it's hard to predict because it is in part dependent upon the provincial authorities in terms of the retail, right? And I think you know, um, we, you know, for example, I would look at um, you know Quebec and Nova Scotia where like great results on a store by store basis, great experience in the stores and everything that happens there. Um, but still, is there room for growth there, right? They, they, they both are in a position where they could add more stores. Um, Manitoba is going through that right now and, and certainly looking at growth. And BC has been on a steady growth rate. So, um, you know, I think where the equilibrium uh, kind of hits in terms of the retail footprint is really in part dependent upon the product offerings that are out there, right? For, for the legal industry um, to compete effectively with the, you know, with the illicit market, um, you know, there still has to be that, you know, full product offering that people are getting. And I think that's going to be really important going forward. And so there are some categories that are still underrepresented in the legal space. And, and some of that is because it's challenging to either A, produce them at scale or B, to produce them in a consistent manner that will meet the specifications that are required in, in the regulated industry. You know, I think on, on a production perspective, on a facility per perspective, I think, you know, we, we are seeing, you know, I'm, I'm still surprised to see the number of new licenses that are being issued. And you, you just wonder, um, you know, what position many of these new companies are going to be able to take. There's going to be companies, you know, either on the nursery side or as a craft grower that can eke out a position for themselves and really build a niche. But, you know, we've already seen, we saw a wave um, previously of creditor protections in the cannabis space. And, you know, I think um, the CWS kind of subsidy helped some companies. Um, and look, we were a company that took advantage of it. And there's government subsidy program, you should. Um, but I think, you know, it stemmed off some of those creditor protections for some companies because, you know, it is still a market where, you know, supply is much greater than demand. But the big, you know, when you hear that comment is, you know, is it the right supply, right? That's the key thing, you know, what we're focused on, making sure we've got the, the product and the, the mix of products that are appropriate for the consumers, because a lot of production volume out there, but it may not be, you know, what the consumers want, which is why we've seen so many companies go down, you know, go through shutting facilities that, um, you know, may not have been producing the product either at the right cost or the quality that uh, the consumer wanted, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's been, I think when the case study is written about the first several years of the Canadian cannabis industry, there'll be, there'll be many, many, many chapters, but one of them, or maybe more, is about the right sort of facility at the right time, producing the right product, and how that may have missed almost entirely. Um, but certainly sort of the facility you guys have in Moncton, uh, you know, indoor, 
the hundred plus rooms, like it really is something to behold. <laughs> and we've been there, it's amazing. So Greg Engel, thanks so much for being here. Uh, today, we look forward to following what, what Organogram is doing and um, I will continue to refresh the page, uh, shred, 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 and see when I can get my hands on it. <laughs> okay, thanks Jay, always good sure. to see you. Thanks Greg. <laughs>